Okay, hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner. I'm here today with my awesome dermatology residents and Dermpath Fellows, and we're going to uh, study metastatic disease to the skin and some other various entities. So I hope you enjoy. All right, this is case one. Who wants it? Yeah, it's a big sample, huh? Big chunk of tissue. Where do you think it's from? Mm, yes, good. And Great. then you see um, like a paisley tie differential. Ah, yeah. With some cystic areas and then some of um, the smaller tadpole islands. And it is going pretty deep down. Yeah, I mean, definitely like below the cartilage here, right? It's all infiltrating around. So, and honestly, I, I don't know this specimen. I, I don't know where this is from, but I would say the two options we really have are where. Where would you have cartilage like this? What's that? Maybe the ear or the nose. Yeah, that's really all we've got, right? Either the, the I guess, the ala, the alar cartilage on the nose um, or the uh, helix or any of the, the cartilaginous structures of the ear. Exactly. Um, it, it's a little strange because the, the cartilage looks very close to the skin surface here. So I would have thought nose and it may be nose, but, but the other side still looks like skin, not like mucosa. So it depends because, you know, the outer part of the nose is skin and then it begins to go in and then it tra transitions into, um, mucosa inside the nose eventually. So it just kind of depends on the orientation, but yeah. Okay, so anyway, you I, I think you probably know what the answer is based on what you're telling me. But what do you think the diagnosis is? A MAC. Yeah, MAC, microcystic adnexal carcinoma. And I think this is a pretty nice example of one uh, because we have a big specimen and you can see how infiltrative it is, right? And it's an important thing to keep in the differential for, um, you know, metastatic carcinomas can sometimes stream and trickle through uh, the tissue like this. But... Um, in this case, the, like you said, there's keratin-filled cystic structures, and there's little infiltrative cords, and a lot of the cords have little openings in the center that make them look like the little tadpole or paisley tie pattern. Um, ideally, you want to be able to see sweat duct differentiation. Now, one problem that can come up with this is that it can sometimes be hard to tell what's a keratin-filled cyst and what's an actual sweat duct, okay? So I think probably those are little sweat ducts here, but uh, sometimes uh, immunostains can be helpful. Uh, here, the main thing though, is we can see how very infiltrative this is. So I think it must be microcystic adnexal carcinoma. And you could also think a little, I mean, there's keratinization. Uh, you could wonder about a squamous cell carcinoma, but it's so very bland. So if you see something that you think is MAC, but it's ugly cytologically, it has you know severely atypical cells, it's probably not MAC. MAC is a very, very bland, very, uh, a very benign looking by the cytology, but it's very infiltrative and because of that locally aggressive. And so uh, these are quite rare in my experience. Um, and then what what are the other, uh, just for our, our audience at home, uh, what are the other things in the differential, the Paisley tie tadpole differential? A morpheiform basal cell and acrine seringoma desmoplastic trichoep. Mm-hmm. Exactly. All four of those things. I feel like it's really pretty easy to rule out basal usually because basal usually has uh, at least some areas that look like if you have a big enough sample, even a very, very morpheiform infiltrative pattern basal, there's usually going to be some areas that look more like regular basal. You'll be like, oh, that's basaloid. It's got maybe a little cleft or a little palisading. It, uh, to me, it doesn't really look like MAC usually. Um, and syringoma can look like this, but usually syringoma is very small. Even on a shave biopsy, usually you can tell. And they usually have very obvious duct differentiation, like you don't have to look for it. And then the, the hardest one to me is desmoplastic trichoepithelioma versus MAC is extremely difficult, especially on a partial biopsy. I feel it's almost impossible, really. Like on a shave biopsy, um, I'll say, well, I think it's probably a desmoplastic trichoepithelioma, but please go and get me a deeper biopsy so I can see the whole lesion. So, and you can see it here infiltrating all the way down past the cartilage into the skeletal muscle 
usually there's there's often those perineural invasion i don't know if there's any in this slide although i will point out something i didn't know in the past is that that desmoplastic trichoeps often have um, perineural involvement we won't say invasion because that sounds bad so that alone is not a feature and i didn't believe it when i first heard it but then a really great paper from um, the uh, jen mcniff uh, her group at yale uh, really has some very convincing data that that oftentimes DTEs have little little bit of tumor right around the nerve and they still have very indolent behavior and don't recur. So, so their paper was so, so well written that I was convinced, even though I was a naysayer uh, and a doubter at first. Really good example of MAC. All right. Okay, who wants this one? Case two. And have punch biopsy, um, kind of the in the mid um, reticular dermis, you can see uh, kind of busy appearance, and yeah. we can zoom in. Um, so you can see these collections of histiocytes sort of palisading around um, kind of altered collagen, and you can appreciate some bluish hue of the mucin as well. So this one is good for GA. Yeah, granuloma annulari. And you might wonder, well, why is that in a slide set about, we haven't seen any METs yet for the skin, no metastases. But I have seen a case of, and I think I sent you guys the link to it a while back, of metastatic uh, breast carcinoma in the skin that clinically looked like GA. And the dermatologist actually sent it in as rule out GA. And microscopically had a kind of a GA-like appearance. It's pretty dramatic. I can send you the slide later and for anyone watching at home I'll, I'll add a link to that um, uh, down in the description below so you can check out that case because that was a really treacherous case um, but at closer look it became obvious that it was not GA but it was pretty subtle so um, write myself a note so I can remember all right good job granuloma annulari and uh, sometimes you can see nice palisading other times it just kind of like trickles so the kind of what we call the interstitial pattern right um, and then finding little zones of mucin and degenerated collagen in the middle. That's very, that's very nice. It's good for GA. Granuloma annulari. Okay, case three. So we have this large, I think there's some epidermis there. Yeah, yeah that it's, funny, the epidermis. it's upside down, I think. There we go. Um, really like hemorrhagic. Oh like, yeah. And, and then areas of clear cells with like trabeculated pattern um, separated by like fibrous bands. So I guess like when we think of clear cell, we think to like balloon cells, even something sebaceous. But I think with this like trabeculated pattern, the hemorrhagic look to it, this would be good for renal cell mass. Yeah, excellent point. And you're right, there are a variety of other clear cell tumors in the skin, but the, the uh, you perfectly recognize this elongated nests or trabecular growth, just like you said, um, with in between these little thin septations. And if you look around, you'll see that most of the septations, there's, there's blood vessels everywhere in here. And that's why it's so bloody and hemorrhagic. There's little vessels in between. Sometimes they're more dilated and you can see them better here. They're kind of compressed together but the, va the rich vascular network in the background between these clear cell nests and trabeculae is the key uh, to recognizing metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Uh, and there are lots of different types of renal cell carcinoma that kind of classic conventional type has these very clear cells, but there are ones that have eosinophilic cells and a whole bunch of others. So they're not always gonna look perfectly clear like this. Uh, uh, depending on the grade of the renal cell, sometimes they have very prominent nucleoli, but not always. I've seen ones, I mean, this one is pretty uniform, like they're not pleomorphic really, right? I mean, they all look kind of the same. This is really a tumor that unless it's one of the higher grade, ugly uh, looking ones, it's going to be relatively bland looking and you're going to recognize it's malignant based on its pattern, right? The clear cytology and uh, the vessels and the, the nested and trabecular growth. And like you pointed out, because of the vessels, they often tend to be very hemorrhagic when they metastasize, especially in the skin and the brain, anywhere that renal cell goes, it tends to be a very bloody hemorrhagic metastasis. One other thing I'd add to your differential is uh, something very rare, but that can look quite like this is primary cutaneous picoma, perivascular epithelioid cell tumor, which is a tumor that is uh, very unusual because it can show co-expression of muscle markers like desmin and actin and also melanocytic markers like 
um, uh, HMB45 and Mart1. And it can, it looks a bit different than this, but it's quite clear and um, it certainly could get mistaken for renal cell. Um, does anyone know what immunostain you could use if you wanted to support a diagnosis? Oh, and before that, I would say also hydradenomas occasionally can have, usually their clear cell change is focal, but I have seen one that was completely clear cell like this and it got misdiagnosed as metastatic renal and then they scanned the patient and their kidneys were normal and then it, it turned out that it was just a hydradenoma, but definitely one that closely mimicked renal. I'll have to find that slide and scan it. Uh, it's a really good learning case. All right, sorry. So what stains could you use, to, as anyone know, if you uh, to diagnose or to help support that it's renal cell if you weren't sure? Um, you could do PAX-E, even though I think that stains with other organs too. Yeah. But but that's, that's the stain I actually really like. If it looks like renal and it's PAX-8 positive, I feel very good. The other things are PAX-8 can stain. It stains thyroid. And uh, uh, PAX-8 also stains tumors from the, the female gynecologic tract, like the mullerian-based tumors, like a lot of the endometrial carcinomas and ovarian carcinomas. Those tend to look a good bit different. Um, so, uh, But there are other stains you could add on if you needed to rule out those things. I mean... Um, pretty unusual. I mean, I've seen metastatic thyroid cancer in the skin, but it doesn't, it, never that I can recall looked like this. But you could add a TTF1, which stains lung cancers, lung adenocarcinomas, but also stains uh, thyroid. And of course, if you ever have trouble with this, go and ask your friendly surgical pathologist uh, colleagues who are always uh, the most up-to-date people, I think, uh, on what, what the newest and hottest stains are, because there's new ones coming out all the time. So... So in any case, I would uh, recommend against CD10. CD10 will stain renal cell, but it also stains P. coma and a whole bunch of other stuff. It's really like almost as bad as Vimentin, and, and I, I almost never use CD10 in my practice. In heme path, maybe it has some role, but in, in derm path and soft tissue pathology, I personally don't like it. All right, case four. All right, I can take this. Okay. All right, um, so it's a pretty big specimen. It looks like um, the dermis kind of towards the bottom, um, and then a very infiltrative process going really deep um, into the dermis, and like approaching the fat as well. Yeah, even down into the fat, wow. Okay. Um, pretty purple, and then as you kind of get closer, it looks like they're trying to yeah. Um, so I was thinking about a metastatic adenocarcinoma. Okay, the big three that I think of are breast, lung, and colon. Um, I think you probably need stains to know for sure, but colon cancer I know can have kind of like that dirty necrosis, and there are kind of a lot of necrotic areas in the center of many of these glands. So that's what I would favor without stains. Um, but yes. Perfect. And this actually is a really nice example of the, the dirty, like very abundant necrosis in the lumens of the glands. So, you know, a lot of times glands are going to have either, you know, like mucin or, or secretion in the middle, but colon cancers tend to make a lot of dead cells in the middle. They also tend to have columnar lining, right? Uh, and so you can see the cells are like tall, right? They're taller than they are. They're not round nuclei. They're kind of elongated nuclei all lined up in a row and uh, pointing towards the lumen. So that columnar cells plus the abundant necrosis, there's even some calcifications in this one, that definitely would strongly point me towards colon, um, a colonic adenocarcinoma or colorectal cancer. Exactly, here's some real abundant necrosis there. Look at that. Yeah, so that's perfect. And uh, like you said, breast and lung are other common uh, carcinomas that metastasize the skin, but you can see all sorts of, you know, basically any kind of carcinoma there is, eventually, you know, there's a chance it can metastasize the skin. I've seen pancreatic cancer go to the skin, gastric, um, all, all the GI primaries, but but other other sites, uh, more esoteric sites as well. But this is a really, a very uh, good example uh, demonstrating metastatic colon cancer. Here, look at all that necrosis there. All the cells are just dying there. All right, good work. And oh, for uh, stains, uh, colon cancers, uh, do you know what, what stains would you think of? So CK20 with it being like below the diaphragm, and I think CDX2. Absolutely. Very good. Yeah. In the, you know, we use CK7 and CK20 are both low molecular weight keratins. 
And sometimes using those in combination can help us to sort out a lot of the adenocarcinomas, particularly because some of them tend to be seven positive only, like breast. Some tend to be 20 positive, but seven negative, like colon cancer. Then there's others that are either double negative or double positive, or it's not as useful because they, they are variable. But yeah, for some of them, particularly like colon cancer, yeah, that's 20 positive, usually seven negative, and CDX2 is a nice nuclear marker that will stain colon cancers and also can stain um, other uh, gastrointestinal uh, carcinoma primaries uh, sometimes. And um, another one uh, that I recently learned about is uh, SATB2, SATB2, which is a marker that um, stains, uh, is, became kind of famous because it stains um, osteosarcoma, it stains osteoblastic cells, but it stains a variety of other things and it can stain colorectal uh, carcinomas and it also tends to stain um, Merkel cell carcinoma too. So kind of interesting. Um, it's one that I've not used very often yet because I haven't had it in, until this uh, current lab. Now I have it available, but in the past I didn't have it readily available. All right. Strong work. Okay. Case five. Well, here we go. Good. It appears having germinal centers um, surrounded by fat. Mm -hmm. And then we go in. Um, you see like mess of melanocytes. Well, they're pigmented cells at least, but yeah. No, I think you're right, but yes. And then, I guess because it's in the like subcapsular space, that would that would make you worry about metastatic melanoma. Yeah, very good. I mean, you're right that that not every melanocyte in a lymph node is melanoma, right? We know that there are benign uh, nevi that uh, exist in the capsule of nodes and are pretty common. They are very bland and they tend to be in the capsule, the fibrous tissue of the capsule of the node itself. And whereas metastatic melanomas usually fill the subcapsular sinusoid, like here you can see this, there's this little space. That's part of how you know something's a lymph node. If you get a big, big nodule of lymphocytes in the fat, like, like you appreciated here, and then if you look around the edge and you see there's a, a layer of fibrous tissue and between the node parenchyma and the fibrous tissue, there's a little space. That's the subcapsular sinus or sinusoid. And um, that's the area where metastases like to go to for a lot of things. And that's exactly what's happening here. This is melanoma right here. This one's kind of interesting mm -hmm. because it's got abundant pigment. Uh, you know, a lot of melanomas don't, don't have a bunch of pigment in their cells, but this one does. And look, this is a little, a little probably a, um, a lymphatic that's draining into the node here, probably coming through the capsule wall. And you can even see tumor cells floating in here. Now, the important pitfall is that not everything pigmented in a node is going to be melanocyte, okay? So you can have people that have bad um, eczematous dermatitis or mm -hmm. other rashes or sometimes people that have a big melanoma making a lot of pigment. They can get melanin pigment both from post-inflammatory pigment or from a melanoma. The pigment can drain through the lymphatics into the node so you can see pigmented melanophages, macrophages that are pigment-laden in a node even though they're not melanocytes. Usually you can tell those with practice. You could also do stains if you had to sort it out. But here, the other thing that helps us not only is this tumor in the, the subcapsular sinus and expanding into the parenchyma of the node, but also it's pretty atypical. It's got some big ugly nuclei with large nucleoli. And so when you have a large enough uh, chunk of tumor in the node uh, to be able to see the cytologic details, then it can become pretty easy. But sometimes it's very challenging when you have really tiny foci of melanocytes. And it can be sometimes hard to tell for sure if they're nevus or if they're melanoma. And they're, that, that's not the problem here, though. So, yeah, this is metastatic melanoma in a lymph node. All right. Case uh, six. Okay, good job. Okay. So we have this kind of like shelled out process. Um, it looks like some glandular neoplasm or spaces from this power. And you could already see that around these spaces, there's a more cellular stroma. And you could see extravasated red blood cells around the spaces. 
Good, and? And then you can see that there's different things. Oh, yeah, hemocidrin, good. And then maybe the faces, there's dirty debris and some red blood cells. And what kind of lining lines the spaces? Yeah, it looks like they are actually, I don't know, it looks kind of like, um, yeah, secreting. Yeah, it's a little hard to describe. Like in some areas, it's very thin and atrophic. In other areas, it looks like kind of a single layer of uh, cuboidal um, epithelial cells. And then some places it gets kind of, well, it's, it's hard because it gets cut at an angle here, but in some places it gets kind of uh, stratified a little bit, right? And there's some little, little blebs on the surface. It's hard to tell if they're like snouts or if they're cilia or what. You could, you know, kind of wonder what exactly is there. You can't really see it very clearly. But yeah, you've got some sort of cuboidal to columnar kind of lining in here. So putting it all together, what would right. you make it? Endometriosis. Yeah, good. This is endometriosis. Very nice. And as you perfectly pointed out, the stroma is really one of the keys to help you there. Because otherwise, seeing glands in the middle of soft tissue where they're not supposed to be, metastatic adenocarcinoma is the first thing that jumps to your mind. And that is a mistake that you can make if you're not if you're not thinking about it or if you have an unusual example of endometriosis. So I mean like look, you could say, well, they, they could look a little bit like colon cancer, maybe a little bit. Um, I'm sure that people who disagree, but especially you're seeing debris and kind of looks almost like necrosis in the background because of all the hemorrhage that's happening. And you see these little glands. Now they're not very atypical, but still they're they're glands with columnar to cuboidal cells and they're in soft tissue. So do you have any idea where we might be here? What is this stuff? They're wavy. Wavy, but... yes. Well, it's not nerve, right? Yeah, I think because of the waviness and you, you can't see the the little cytoplasm very well but see all of the pink is actually fiber it's collagen fiber here so so when we see this wavy the pink in between the cells is collagen fiber um so this is actually dense regular connective tissue so tendon fascia or ligament obviously ligaments not going to be on your derm path so tendon or fascia and there's a bunch of it it's like a, such a thick layer it's so thick this is thicker than you guys really probably ever see in in derm path because this is probably like the rectus abdominis uh, muscle, okay, right on the sheath around the rectus abdominis muscle, um, because it's probably the anterior abdominal wall, because that's a good site for endometriosis, right? Uh, it can occur, I feel like the most common place I see endometriosis is in the abdominal wall, in the either in the, at any layer of the abdominal wall, often in patients who have had like a C-section before and some little bit of endometrium got in there, I guess is kind of one of the theories of how this happens. And then also you can occasionally see it like in the, the skin of the vulva. Um, and, and of course, internally, you can see it in the, in the pelvic area. Uh, but but yeah, when, when you're gonna encounter it, it's gonna most often be, I think, uh, I get it taken out by surgeons from the abdominal wall as a nodule that's painful, often painful during the woman's menstrual cycle. Uh, because the the endometrium here undergoes the same cycling that the endometrium in the uterus goes through. And so with that process of sloughing off and, and hemorrhaging, um, obviously it can be quite painful and, and uh, real, real uncomfortable for the patient. And here's some skeletal muscle. You can see the striations here very nicely. And then this is a good example. This is all atrophic skeletal muscle. And when, when skeletal muscle atrophies, it starts looking pretty weird because the nuclei all pile up on each other and they can start looking very big and bizarre sometimes, like like so. Can look like atypia so uh yeah endometriosis and this is probably in the abdominal wall soft tissue um and the other thing that can be challenging and thankfully i've not encountered this uh, really often but i've seen some slides of it is um you can get um 
I'm blanking on the word right now. Maybe I'll have to cut this part out. The Oh, decidualized. You get decidualization sometimes with certain hormone therapies, and it can make the stroma of the endometriosis look really wild and like big, huge, plump epithelioid cells and sheets. Um, uh, I've seen uh, some slides of it, and it looks scary. So I, maybe I'll have to have my gynecologic pathology colleagues teach me more about that because I think it's something that you see in in the uterus sometimes but uh it, in endometriosis when you see that in the middle of soft tissue somewhere it's pretty weird looking so so i'll have to find an example of that uh to scan all right case seven what do you think who takes right. this one? Right. So, looks like a kind of a dermal proliferation of cells um kind of compact and dense looks pretty well circumscribed um, from this tower. Okay. Just going in, you see, I guess I favor mostly they're just spindle fibroblasts. Yeah. Not seeing a lot of atypia. It was very well circumscribed. Didn't go very deep. Um, it's going to look for some collagen trapping uh, on the periphery. Um, but from the low power, I guess my, my first thought was a dermatofibroma. Good. That's what it is. Yeah, this is a dermatofibroma. I think Dr. Farringer puts in some stuff that's not uh, on topic to make sure that, that, that to keep you guys on your toes and make sure that you. They were like, well, I think it's just a DF. Yeah, it's just a DF. But, you know, I think it, and here's your, here's a nice collagen trapping. Look at that. And this is one of those kind of very atrophic forms of DF. I feel like there's, you know, there's a range. DFs have like so many different flavors, so to speak. And at one end of the spectrum are these really subtle ones where you have these little boomerang shaped fibrohistiocytic cells, whatever they are, fibroblast, histiocytes, something in between wrapping around, like they're twisting and wrapping around each individual little collagen bundle. I find that real helpful. Uh, really helpful here. Let's see. See like that. See how each one is kind of kind of curving around a collagen bundle. I think that's really useful for this pattern of DF. And sometimes uh, recognizing this pattern right here. This is a pattern. Recognize that in your mind of individual little collagen bundles getting wrapped and trapped. Because that's very different than the more cellular, you know, the kind of conventional form of DF that has more cellularity to it. And you can see nice trapping of big collagen bundles at the side, but in the middle, it's kind of more sheets of, of haphazard spindle cells. But I find that this pattern can sometimes be tricky because it's so subtle that you might think, is it a scar? Is it something else? Is it just fibrosis? And that's what helps me on recognizing this is that individual kind of triangle or boomerang shaped cells that are curving and wrapping around individual little fibers of collagen. And why that's helpful is that sometimes you'll get a shave biopsy that shows the epidermis, which in this case shows the epidermal hyperplasia and the increased pigmentation of the basal layer, right? That kind of induction change There's not actually hair follicle formation here, but there's epidermal, look, look at the normal epidermis. And then here it's thickened, the, the tabling, the reedy get flat on the bottom, there's increased pigment. So on a shave, you might think, let's like a lentigo that's irritated and scratched maybe, or a, a little bit like a flat seborrheic keratosis. But if you see underneath it, the little spindle cells wrapping around collagen, then I know oh, this is just the top of a dermatofibroma. So uh, granted, I mean, the other option would be calling it something else benign. So it's not the end of the world, but that's helpful. I find a lot of times it's, it's challenging for beginners um, and even more advanced learners to recognize the really subtle, like one little field of that underneath an epidermal proliferation and recognizing, oh, that's, that's the DF there. So, but that's, this is a great example. That's a pattern to put into your mind. And the other reason is that, that DF is important in this differential is just like GA. I mean, I've not really ever had a metastatic carcinoma that I thought really looked like a DF that I can recall, but DF and granuloma annulari can actually look alike. Not when you have the whole lesion, but the edge of a granuloma annulari where those histiocytes trickle in between collagen, they do a little bit of collagen trapping and wrapping just like you can see here. So if you took a, a high power field of this and a high power field at the edge of a GA, they can look pretty similar. And the other thing that can look kind of like this pattern is the edge of a hypopigmented blue nevus. Blue nevi tend to get sclerotic collagen in the background and when they don't have a lot of pigment, they can really have areas that look, I mean, they can look quite like a dermatofibroma. 
So they're all benign things in that, that differential, but I do think that people don't often teach those together, but granuloma annulare, subtle dermatofibroma, <clears throat> hypopigmented blue nevi, I, oh. I definitely think that they have times and areas of, that they can mimic one another. So you can make that into a little triad differential if you want. And this has been picked and scratched and like kenified on the surface. Dermatofibroma, and I have a full long video about dermatofibromas. I'll put a link down below. Right, case eight. Okay, um, so we have this huge excision specimen, and um, you can see these areas of blue mucin. Yes. Um, and kind of like inside uh, this mucinous, I guess you could call it mucinous stroma. Um, you see these dark blue small islands of um, cells that look kind of like small glands. Um, so, so this one kind of sea of mucin, small um, islands of glandular cells, uh, good for mucinous carcinoma. Yeah, perfect classic example. Let me go back to low power so we can see what we're dealing with. This is definitely on an older person with sun damage. It's on their face. We can see lots of sebaceous glands. And here we're we're seeing lots of skeletal muscle, right? And up at the top, I noticed something. I don't know for sure, but I think this is probably a lacrimal gland. Some, some ophthalmic pathologist watching this can tell me if I'm wrong or right uh, if you're watching this online. But it looks like little mucin, uh, mucin glands and then little ducts here. And I don't see lacrimal glands very often, but these tumors usually occur around the eye, primary cutaneous mucinous carcinoma. So I'm guessing that's what it is. If I were near the mouth, I would have thought this was a minor salivary gland. But um, in any case, the what we see is, yeah, like you said, big, huge pools of mucin, a sea of mucin, and variable amounts of islands of floating cells. Look. Sometimes you just got a bunch of mucin and you only have a few islands in here. So uh, this one, it really can vary in its cellularity. Most of the cases of mucinous carcinoma I've seen in the skin are very bland cytologically. The nuclei are a little bit hyperchromatic, but relatively uniform. But there are some that can have more atypia. Sometimes they do make little gland or, or like uh, mucin filled spaces in the middle of each island, but they can really have a variation of appearance. And usually when you see a mucinous carcinoma like this in the skin, especially near the eye, almost always it's going to be primary, not a metastasis. But there are mucinous carcinomas in the breast and elsewhere in the body that can look a lot like this, basically identical to this. And theoretically, those could metastasize the skin. But like mucinous carcinoma of the breast, my understanding is it does not often metastasize because it's a low-grade indolent form of uh, carcinoma. Um, so, And also near the eye, that site is so good. Problem is that immunostains can be really difficult to tell apart, like a mucinous breast carcinoma from a mucinous carcinoma of the skin. But to me, when I see this near the eye, I, I'm sure that it's gonna end up being primary. I don't think I've ever seen a metastatic mucinous carcinoma uh, near the eye that ended up being from an internal primary. In fact, I think I've only seen one mucinous carcinoma of the skin that was a metastasis and it was like on the buttock or the thigh and the person had a mucinous carcinoma of the GI tract or something, if I recall. And it didn't look like this. It looked uglier and, and didn't, didn't look classic like this. The other thing that can help you is these tumors often arise from a kind of in situ precursor. And that uh, this is kind of an evolving area of understanding in derm path, but it's called endocrine mucin producing sweat gland carcinoma that also arises near the eye. And it, it, it's kind of like has areas that look like hydrocystoma, but then you have a thickening of the lining of the wall and it produces neuroendocrine markers. And we see sometimes muc invasive mucinous carcinomas growing out of that background. So if you look around in a mucinous carcinoma and you see stuff that looks kind of like hydrocystoma or areas that are, that are coming out of an obvious cyst that's lined by a layer of myoepithelium around the outside, then that's proof that what you're dealing with is actually a primary cutaneous process. So these do need complete excision, but they, they are pretty indolent. So even though this looks, it's near the eye, it's not a great site, but these are these have a very good prognosis overall. Um, so that's a, a really good example of mucinous carcinoma of the skin. All right, case nine. Still loading, but it looks 
like a pretty purple uh, marble or nodule area. Um, yes, that's true. What about a higher power? Yeah, I'm at higher too, sorry. Um, if we go through like a purple or a small purple cell differential like the lemon, um, you could think of like a mercurial or neuroblastoma or like an oat cell. Like a lymphoma. Yeah, round blue cell tumors are challenging because you've got uh, the differential, like you said, and just to clarify for everyone, the O of oat cell, which works really well to make lemons pronounceable, um, uh, oat cell now is called a small cell carcinoma of the lung, okay? But um, but in the olden days, <clears throat> it was called oat cell, and I recognize it makes that um, that mnemonic work nicely. So, so uh, and there are some benign things that can be round and blue, but do you think this is benign or malignant? Yeah, mites, and it's hard to see on scans, especially this is pretty dark, but mite, 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 yeah, tons of mites. And there's also some little necrosis up here. Here you go. There's a little bit of a kind of single cell necrosis okay. in that area and right here. Yeah, so malignant. And then if you had to vote, obviously, we usually employ immunostains in round blue cell tumors. The thing that stands out to me here that helps is the cells are forming nests. It's pretty subtle. But see how they're clustering in little groups and aggregates. So it's when you know when you have just a sheet of cells, it's really hard because it could be pretty much all of those things. But once I start seeing clumping and clustering into nests, then that makes me favor probably we're dealing with something epithelial, a carcinoma. So then I would think Merkel cell or uh, a metastatic small cell carcinoma of the lung or other neuroendocrine carcinoma from internal primary. Uh, I would still do immunostains in a case like this. But uh, that makes me think. So sometimes looking around, and you sometimes need to look at the edge to find that, but finding some nesting areas can be helpful. Uh, lymphomas tend to be arranged in sheets, and they're discohesive. They kind of float around. But in, in any case, I feel like these cells are kind of cohesive and clinging together. Now, the, the problem is, is that on this scan, we can't really see the chromatin pattern very nicely to tell if it's salt and pepper and speckly or um, stippled chromatin or if it's fine, smudgy chromatin. I mean, they I don't see big nucleoli, I can say that. And usually in neuroendocrine, uh, like small cell carcinoma or Merkel, you tend to not see big, huge nucleoli. Um, you tend to have kind of more even chromatin. So in this case, from the notes, this is a metastatic uh, lung um, small cell carcinoma, a small cell, a, a form of neuroendocrine carcinoma of the lung. So that is what this uh, case was. But we would do stains, and you can use synaptophysin and chromogranin as neuroendocrine markers. There's also a newer a neuroendocrine marker called INSM1. It's an insulinoma um, uh, associated protein 1. But anyway, INSM1, uh, and it's a nuclear stain that stains neuroendocrine tumors. And then um, depending on where it's from, Merkel cells uh, usually are CK20 positive and often have a dot-like pattern. Uh, neuroendocrine carcinomas from the lung use their CK7 positive and 20 negative, and then they'll also express the lung marker uh, TTF1 usually. So as a, a standard approach, if I see something like this in the skin and I think it's going to be Merkel, I usually start with a CK20, and I've started doing TTF1 also. So TTF1 negative, CK20 positive, I'll say Merkel cell carcinoma. If it, if it doesn't stain that way, then I expand my stains. And uh, of course, obviously, knowing patient history can be really, really helpful uh, as well. Okay, case 10. So this one we have a, a punch biopsy, and it looks like there's kind of like tufts of cells throughout the kind of superficial and deeper dermis. But then on higher power, those tufts are actually dilated vascular spaces. And then within the spaces, there are these like atypical kind of larger cells. Um, it's just like really pleomorphic or zomitosis. Yeah. So it definitely looks malignant. Um, yes. And it's, it looks really confined to the vascular spaces, maybe with some like inflammatory. Actually, maybe there are some kind of. Yeah, there may be a few out, but you're right. The Predominantly, they are just packing and filling 
dilated lymphatic spaces are, yes, exactly like you said. So, um, inflammatory breast cancer, I think, is the big one that we think of that. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. This pattern could could occur in other forms of uh, metastatic carcinoma, but it's certainly this is the classic, the textbook example of what um, inflammatory breast cancer looks like. And obviously, that's a clinical term, right, for the patients who get that peau d'orange, um, inflamed, thickened skin on the surface of the breast. And then what they see microscopically is we see all the lymphatics plugged and filled up with tumor, and that's causing kind of a localized lymphedema. And then in this case, there's also a lot of inflammation around it. But um, yes, that, that pattern right away, the very first thing on your differential should be breast. You can use markers to help support that it's breast uh, primary. And of course, the patient history is very important and oftentimes uh, knowing what the mammography showed or if the patient had a history of breast cancer, um, is that's the first step really is finding that. And then you can just use some stains to confirm it. Um, and uh, that is, a, it's a really, a, of course, a very unfortunate and aggressive um, uh, situation and, and a bad disease for the patient. But this is a very good example of it. And, and you can see how some of these are very, very focal. So when I get a skin biopsy of, of breast skin and there's a concern for thickening or reddening of the skin, it, those are one of the specimens I look at very closely and I'll, I'll often do deeper levels on because um, I want to make sure that I'm not missing a little tiny focus of metastatic breast cancer in a lymphatic. Also, if they've had radiation, I want to look very carefully to make sure I'm not missing a small focus of angiosarcoma. I've seen cases where the, because of sampling variation, I, it was only a very small area. So I, I scrutinize those closely and I generally, especially for women with a radiation history or, or changes to the skin texture of the breast, I recommend close follow-up and either the process gets better or they need to biopsy it again if they have continued concern. Um, because I, I think that's a really treacherous area. And sometimes that, like I said, sometimes a, a biopsy won't sample the proper area um, just because of the variability of those diseases. So it's one of those times where I want close follow-up. Now that said, I've seen plenty of times where women have thickening or reddening of their breast skin, sometimes in the context of radiation, where they end up having nothing. We never can find anything except some subtle lymphatic dilation, kind of lymphedema looking changes. And in over time, in my experience, I've seen quite a few of these lymphedema-like changes of the breast skin. Oftentimes they kind of are transient and they, they can get kind of reddening to them. I think sometimes they'll get like little, uh, little um, thrombi in some of the vessels too, but then it kind of resolves and spontaneously spontaneously goes away. I've seen that happen multiple times now where I was really worried and I thought, oh, this is going to be something bad. You need to have the patient come back in a week and check them, biopsy them again. And the patient came back and their skin was normal. So I do think they need close follow-up, but I've definitely seen lots of benign situations that mimic that. Uh, not so much the inflammatory breast cancer, but that kind of made me think more of like angiosarcoma in the breast. But in any case, that's a lecture for a different day. Spaces. Yes, so good. Even before it landed, so I see down into the dermis, but they look kind of vertically oriented. Um, and then over the top, the epi is maybe a little bit acanthotic. There's like a sebaceous gland right next to where the duct kind of opens, and then lots of like little smooth muscle buckles scattered in the dermis. So all of that is making me think like nipple or accessory nipple, and I think those glands. They look pretty friendly or just part of the nipple. Yeah, exactly. These are the lactiferous ducts um, that are that drain the you know the milk to the nipple from the normal breast. But here in this little uh, little uh, small papule on the chest um, in the milk line, this would be an accessory nipple, and that's exactly what it is. And so this these tend to be like kind of double layered cuboidal. Sometimes they have little snouts on the the uh, luminal the apical surface of the cells. You can see there's like a little second layer of myoepithelial cells there, and they're very bland. I do look closer though, just to make sure I'm not missing uh, carcinoma, like pagetoid, uh, like Paget's disease in the duct um, and the skin when I see these, just to make sure. Look, there's also some uh, apocrine glands here, and uh, nipple is one of the sites where you can see apocrine glands normally in the body. There's the smooth muscle, like you said, and sometimes. Uh, this is a really good example because you can really see big dilated ducts, but sometimes an accessory nipple is just going to have a little bit of kind of almost seborrheic keratosis looking change on the top and maybe a little bit extra smooth muscle and a tiny little glimpse of one of these ducts. So it's not always going to be so dramatic. It can be much, much more subtle than this. Like here, here's the other side of the same lesion. If I saw this and they said it was a little brown papule on the chest wall and it was in the milk line, 
<clears throat> I don't see any gland, but I might say well, this is suggestive because there's an increased number of smooth muscle bundles here. There's epidermal acanthosis up top. I might cut deeper and look for a duct. But in this case, since we have the other half of the biopsy, <clears throat> you can see that this is definitely an accessory nipple or polythelia, I think is the other name for that. Case 12, once it loads here. Okay, so this one is kind of a deep dermal, like not um, proliferation. Going closer, this one has some clear cystic spaces. Yeah. Let's see if there's. And then down. Here's a bigger space so here. This would be good for like hydrotinoma. Yeah, we've got from low power, it's multiple nodules, right? You can see they're forming like big, big nodules are almost nests basically. So probably going to be an epithelial. Um, tumor, at least at first glance. And then the ducts and the glandular spaces in hydradenoma, this is a hydradenoma, like you said, which is part of the acrospiroma family, at least in my way of thinking. The, in hydradenoma, the ducts can be of all variable sizes. Sometimes they're very tiny little ducts like this. Uh, and then those range up to large spaces, sometimes which are filled with secretion, sometimes not. Sometimes you can see the spaces are lined by like a nice columnar layer with some little snouts. So here it's real easy to appreciate. This is a gland or duct space, no problem. But sometimes the, the duct spaces get so dilated that it's hard to actually tell if it's a real space or an artifact like here. See, it's like just, it's totally opened up. You don't really see a discrete uh, lining of like columnar cells like we saw in that other one. But these big open spaces, sometimes this is all you get. And this is actually, this is the duct space. It's just really, really expanded. But you know, where in a lot of sweat gland tumors, you see really discrete ducts. It's not always the case with hydradenoma. This one had some nice discrete ducts, but a lot of times it's just big cystic space. The cells can range from being uh, squamoid looking, kind of like keratinocytes, or all the way to being clear, but they tend to be uniform and monotonous. They all look the same, single cell type basically and um, they have uh, eosinophilic to pale to clear cytoplasm that varies throughout the tumor. See very, very clear cytoplasm here, uh, probably because of abundant glycogen in the cells. And so when the whole tumor is made of clear cells like this, then you can struggle and think about renal cell carcinoma, but otherwise, uh, usually other areas of the tumor look classic for hydradenoma, and so then it's easier to tell. And people can say clear cell hydradenoma, nodular and cystic hydradenoma. Some people like to call them acrospiroma, like in, in all things in derm path, but especially in sweat gland or uh, in uh, nexal pathology, we love to split and name things and rename them. That's just the, the derm path way. It's an, a timeless tradition. So that's what we do um, in any case. And then here's some little smaller areas out here. So this is a nice example of a hydradenoma. 13. So we have these two nodules in the dermis. And you can see from this power that there's these spaces mm -hmm. in the nodules. I mean, typically when you see blue nodules, I mean, we think of basal cells, obviously, it doesn't have that stroma here. Yeah, good point. And almost like these spaces are almost creating like that curvature form look yeah. to these basaloid islands. So they would be again some sort of in the category of adenocarcinoma with the curvature form spaces. I would think of um, adenoid cystic carcinoma. Yeah, very good. This I think is a really nice classic example of adenoid cystic carcinoma. The cells are, are round blue and, and very monotonous, at least from most of the adenoid cystics I've seen. I've only seen a handful of cutaneous ones and then some in the salivary gland too, but they are made of round blue cells that have uniform nuclei <clears throat> and they have these mucin filled or, or mucin filled spaces that are very sharply circumscribed, right? They're very round circles. I guess some of these are a little more oval, but they're very, very sharply delim delimited and like almost the, the appearance is punched out like a cookie cutter cutting out a sheet of cookie dough. 
Um, <clears throat> and that's, uh, that's kind of the classic appearance in th these multiple, very sharply circumscribed mucin-filled spaces. And it's often multinodular and in the dermis or into the subcutis. And so the main differential I think that comes up with this is the adenoid pattern of basal cell carcinoma because basal cells have blue cells and they can make mucin filled pools. The biggest thing to me is that the blue pools in, the, in a basal cell, you might have some that are round, but most of them are really irregular and kind of of all different shapes and sizes. And here, I guess we do have different sizes, but all of these are very discreet and very sharply uh, punched out. If you see a couple cutanea or a couple examples of adenoid cystic carcinoma, back to back with a couple examples of adenoid variant of basal cell carcinoma, which when I sign those out in practice, I just call them basal cell nodular type because the adenoid doesn't mean anything and I don't want it to cause any confusion uh, with the treating physician. So, um, so in any case, um, when you compare a few of them back to back, they really do look quite different. And I like your point, um, Dr. Fiore, about the, the lack of the typical basal cell stroma, although there is some clefting artifact here. So clefts alone don't, don't prove something's basal. The other thing that really would help me here is, look, we are like a way away from the epidermis. I guess there is scar here, so this could have been a recurrence. But, you know, basal cells e usually either connect to the epidermis or are very closely approximated to the epidermis. So if you have a deep nodule that's far from the epidermis, uh, I feel like that's usually less likely to be a basal cell, or at least it right away makes me suspect other things than basal cells. So that's a really nice example of primary cutaneous adenoid cystic carcinoma. I think a really important thing here is you have to rule out a metastasis. Even though a skin met from uh, a salivary gland adenoid cystic, I think is quite uncommon. I don't believe I've ever seen one. I've seen adenoid cystic in the salivary gland tends to be an aggressive disease because it's infiltrative and it gets into the nerve, uh, often arises in the parotid. Um, I hope I'm not misspeaking about any of that. Uh, my ENT path colleagues can correct me in the comment section. Uh, but in any case, the ones I've seen, they've behaved aggressively locally. I have also seen a couple metastatic or at least one metastatic adenoid cystic carcinoma to the bone, um, like it went to the, the, the hip or somewhere. Um, that was pretty surprising, but I don't think I've seen one in the skin. But I think it's important, especially if, if you're on the face, always make sure that there's not direct connection to the underlying salivary gland. Anywhere else, it's probably not a bad idea to get a scan of the salivary gland just to make sure that you're not missing something much more serious there. But when these are primary cutaneous arising in the skin, they tend to have indolent behavior and I think are usually cured as long as you excise them with negative margins. So they're much less aggressive in the skin than they are in the salivary glands. All right, now case 14. I'm going to all rotate it real quick. So there's this kind of deeply pigmented dermal nodule. Um, looks like somewhat facing the, the radius, the, the epidermis, and uh, where it's at. I guess as you zoom in, it looks like there's some large epithelioid type cells. Um, some are hyperchromatic. Um, obviously, I think, you know, be, I guess being in this, on this topic and this much pigment in those large epithelioid cells, I think of melanoma. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't really mature, right? It, it's a little hard, I agree, to evaluate. Um, it, it, just all looks kind of the same. And it's like this little nodule, right? So the here there's, you know, there's no involvement of the epidermis. It's just like filling up the papillary dermis. But over here, we have a couple atypical melanocytes with a little patch to it spread and, and some growing into there. So when you see this pattern, even though there are some intraepidermal cells, this pattern right here always makes me think of a metastasis. Metastatic melanoma tends to form a ball. As soon as it forms a ball in the deep dermis or the subcutis, then it's easy to say, well, that's metastatic, right? Unless there's a scar next to it and it's a recurrence. But here, the uh, some melanoma, like little satellite lesions, particularly um, around uh, satellite or in transit mets, sometimes they pop up in the, the superficial dermis. And when they do, they push up into the epidermis and it tends to almost make a little collarette of epidermis around it sometimes. And though that form of metastatic melanoma sometimes crawls back up into the epidermis and mimics melanoma in situ. So if you didn't know the history, you could see this and say, oh, well, there's in situ components, so it must be a primary melanoma. And then you give it a Breslow depth or thickness and then and treat it like a primary. Again, the history is the real crucial thing. But anytime I see this, this pattern of pushed up into the epidermis, I always think, could it be metastatic melanoma? 
And in this case also, you're right, the, these are pretty plump and relatively atypical, although they don't have, you know, huge nucleoli. We can't really see the cytology well. But there's a mite right there too, but in another mite right there. But mitoses are hard to see on a scan, I feel like a lot of times. Oh, there's a mitosis also. I've just been looking at scan slides for a long time, so I kind of can recognize, oh, that's, yeah, that's probably a mitosis. But I feel like they're, they're a little harder to pick up on on these particular scans. Uh, newer uh, high-tech scans have much higher resolution and, and really a lot crisper and easier to see. Okay. Uh, epidermotropic metastasis is what we call this when it, when it gets back into the epidermis. And we didn't show examples, but other types of uh, metastases can sometimes become epidermotropic and crawl into the epidermis. Okay, this is case 15. Um, I have a, we have a blue nodule in the deep epidermis, um, and it looks like a little maze of kind of these branching cystic spaces. Yeah. Um, and this kind of little um, papillary fronds protruding. And if we go to the high power, um, kind of to appreciate the lining of these islands, uh, you can see uh, this little snouting and de decapitation secretion. Um, so this one is good for age cap. Yeah, this is a really just perfect hydradenoma papilliferum, unrelated to the hydradenoma we discussed previously, um, despite the name. And I love how you said it, the maze-like appearance, because all of these fronds and papillae are all pushed into the center of kind of a big cystic space or a nodule, and all of the gland spaces get this maze-like appearance. Um, and I think it's a, a perfect way to describe it. Sometimes they can show prominent apocrine metaplasia. I've seen cases that had a lot of, of actual uh, epi, um, uh, eosinophilic um, cytoplasm and apocrine uh, nuclei. Sometimes apocrine cells get these, these bright red granules in them. I'm not exactly sure what those are, but I, they are a normal component of normal apocrine glands in my experience. And apocrine cells tend to have prominent uh, single nucleoli, so don't let that alarm you. If you see apocrine, um, cells don't don't be surprised to see big nucleoli cytologically. That's totally normal. Yeah, so this is great hydradenoma papilliferum, and they usually occur, of course, in the vulva and um, and the anogenital area. And you can see here we've got lots of uh, little smooth muscle bundles, which is typical of the uh, labia majora, and also the scrotum has that as well. Uh, multiple small smooth muscle bundles. Good job. So very classic example. And there's another view of it that you can see. It's a cyst. So it's got a cyst lining around the outside, and it's a bunch of papillae trapped in the middle of that cyst. And look, here's more of that apocrine kind of metaplasia. Pretty cool. This is such a pretty tumor. Benign and beautiful, right? You can't beat it. Okay, case 16. All right, we have a larger excision, it looks like. Um, and in the epidermis, there looks like some clearing. Yes, that's true. So there's like some larger bluish gray cytoplasm from this far. Um, it looks like it has a pagetoid scatter. Yes. For this differential, I sometimes think about pagets, like a pagetoid melanoma. Um, and what other thing can give you pagetoid spread? Like STC. Yes, yeah, squamous cell carcinoma, which I, I think honestly probably the most common thing I see pagetoid spread in is actually squamous cell carcinoma. Just because squamous cell carcinomas are so common, squamous cell carcinoma in situ or Bowen's disease often has pagetoid cells. Uh, pagets of the nipple and also extra mammary pagets in the anogenital genital area um, and then melanoma of course the top three things and there are some others like sebaceous carcinomas and rarely Merkel cell carcinomas etc but yeah so one thing that would help us is where are we anatomically there looks like some muscle bundles down there yeah maybe on the field red site like the genital or the breast yeah, exactly. Anytime you have increased smooth muscle bundles, think of the, the genital skin, particularly the labia majora or the, um, the scrotum or the, the nipple or areola area. I find that the, 
that the genital skin, the smooth muscle tends to be these really small little bundles, lots and lots of little small ones. In the areola and nipple, they tend to be much larger smooth muscle bundles, although that doesn't always work perfectly. But I feel like here that um, makes me think uh, that we're probably in the anogenital genital area. And yeah, the, you described it nicely. There, there's pale cytoplasm, these large atypical epithelioid cells, some of which are solitary, others are forming small nests in the epidermis and they have pale cytoplasm and they have patchetoid spread, and you can even see them, some of them are trickled up all the way into the stratum corneum. And in some areas you can see like kind of the eyeliner sign, I thought I saw it earlier. Now, maybe not the best. So you can see the eyeliner sign, oh there, a compressed layer of uh, basal keratinocytes underneath the tumor cells. You see that in squamous cell carcinoma and also in Paget's. And actually someone pointed out to me, I think on Twitter, I can't remember who it was. I, my apologies to whoever it was if they're watching this, but they pointed out that you have um, in, uh, in Paget's, the eyeliner sign tends to be really crushed. It tends to be a real thin eyeliner sign, whereas the basal layer is a little thick, or the basal keratinocyte layer is a little thicker and more plump in uh, underneath the squamous cell carcinoma that has pagetoid spread. And I thought that was pretty cool. I mean, usually there's not a real serious problem telling these apart. I mean, I feel like pagetoid squame doesn't really look quite like Paget's disease, which is what this is. This is extra mammary Paget's from the anogenital area. And also sometimes it forms little glands and ducts that can be mucin filled. <clears throat> sometimes you can see little droplets of blue mucin in the cytoplasm of the cells, like right there probably. Um, a little hard to appreciate here, but you can see those little pale blue areas. Yeah, that's mucin right there. So, um, which is like the ciliated um, mucin that's, that's made by secretory adenocarcinoma cells um, or glandular cells. So you can do a stain from mucin, like a mucicarmin, to find that mucin, although we can see it here on H&E. And you can also do uh, other stains for Paget's. What, what stains uh, would you like for Paget's disease? And there's a variety of answers that could be used here. Like it's CK7 positive, you can get uh, the CAM 5.2. Um, if it's like extra mammary Paget's, I think that like gross cystic, um, it's like GCFDP or... Yeah, like gross cystic blood. fluid disease protein, yeah, can stain. Uh, I tend to not like that marker because it's kind of dirty and not real specific, but yeah, it, it will stain, you know, a it's a breast cancer marker, but it can stain a nexal things also. Look here what we've got. We've got Paget cells making a little duct, but they're actually, what they're doing is they're tracking down an eccrine duct. That's kind of kind of interesting. So yeah, I, I tend to like CK7, cytokeratin 7 as my go-to. Not every case of Paget will stain with that, but the majority of them do. Um, a couple important things to note in extra mammary patches is, it, is especially if the rash, the, the clinical red area, because oftentimes these present as a red erythematous eruption in the genitals, like a plaque or a, pa a large spreading patch. Um, if it um, approximates an orifice, an opening, the anus, the urethra, the vagina, then you need to make sure that you check internally, get them to the appropriate um, uh, specialist to do an internal look to make sure they don't have an internal carcinoma that's growing outward onto the skin. Um, and that's basically secondary extra mammary pages, which is like a colorectal cancer spreading out through the, uh, the mucosa and then the uh, epithelium around the anus and then involving the skin secondarily, okay? So those tend to stain like colorectal cancers with CK20 and CDX2. Uh, however, uh, uh, primary extra mammary pagets that, that's not coming from an internal primary when it's near the anus can actually sometimes stain like uh, colorectal cancer. It can stain with CK20 and I believe CDX2 because it is probably embryologically, it's arising from some glandular tissue that was part of the, I think, the, the cloacal area of the hindgut, if I recall. I don't know. That I might be wrong on that. It's been a long time since I've thought about embryology. But in any case, the some of I, I've not, I don't think I've ever seen one of those cases. But if you see a case that stains like colon cancer, get a scope. You just got to make sure. And also, I've rarely seen like urethelial carcinoma growing out uh, like onto the glands penis to produce extra mammary pagets. So the, it's pretty rare to see that. The other thing, especially when there's a lot of inflammation here, is look around to make sure that there's not invasion because extra mammary pagets starts as an in situ carcinoma, but it can also invade the dermis. And sometimes those can behave more aggressively. Um, so uh, it's important to look for that and make sure that you don't uh, miss it. Very good example of extra mammary patches diseases of the, um, the genital region.
All right, case, uh, we'll turn it right side up, case 17. proliferation in the dermis. There's some like cystic areas over top that look more like keratin filled and then more like you know, papilluminous ducts. Okay. Um, so my first thought was could this be something malignant just because it looks so like tightly packed and some of the ducts don't even have like a space in them. Like they're just like all ductal cells whereas other kinds of spaces. Um, so I thought about you know if we're on the breast or the nipple, which I kind of thought we were based on sight, could this be like a breast cancer? But then there's also like a nipple adenoma that I know can have like this ductal proliferation. And um, so I think those two are kind of in my. Yeah, good. That's great. Uh, and you're right. We have large uh, smooth muscle bundles. We can see actually a lactiferous duct here, a normal nipple duct coming up. So we are on the nipple. And then we have this mass that is arising right next to the nipple. There's some keratin debris up here too. You can even see it connect up to the surface, like right here, see? It comes right up and connects to the surface in a couple of places. So this, this is actually, like you said, a nipple adenoma, which is also known sometimes as erosive adenomatosis of the nipple. It can sometimes ulcerate and can clinically mimic Paget's disease of the nipple. Cytologically, though, it's bland. That you can see that there's an intact uh, myoepithelial layer around the outside, each of these um, uh, large aggregates. And the inside has this kind of complex papillary and maze-like configuration. It reminds me sometimes of hydradenoma papilliferum of the, the genitals, right? It has kind of a similar bunch of papillae packed into spaces. But here, there, there are a lot of small little ducts that are filled up with this kind of complex papillary lining. So uh, for people that do breast pathology, this has been likened to a lot of similarity to the changes that you can see in usual ductal hyperplasia of the breast. And I'm certainly not a breast pathologist, so I can't um, speak to with skill about that. Um, and also um, um, a ductal, an introductal papilloma of the nipple can have a very similar appearance to this. So I, I, this is a relatively uncommon disease, at least in my practice. I've only seen a handful of them. When I see them, I usually recommend the dermatologist to send the patient to a breast surgeon just so that they can evaluate the patient to make sure that there's not like a larger nipple um, uh, introductal papilloma going down in the underlying breast because my understanding is that those often, they like to remove them completely just to make sure there's no areas of carcinoma developing in the papilloma. Uh, again, I'm not a breast pathologist. I think on this one, we can nicely see a lot of times I just get a small biopsy so I don't know. And I think also clinically, if it's a small area or if you feel like there's a deeper mass under it, that can be helpful. But here we can really see, I think that this is, looks like it's a nodule really in the nipple. And you can see that at the base of the lesion, it kind of goes away and we're getting down uh, deeper in, into the normal nipple and breast underneath. So, so I think this fits really perfectly actually for nipple um, adenoma or erosive adenomatosis, which is, is a benign uh, process. But like you said, you want to make sure that you're not missing something more scary, like a breast cancer. And you also want to make sure that we're that the sample we're seeing is actually adequate. So I think it's not a bad idea to get a breast pathologist to take a look if you're having any trouble with one of these, because they're much more familiar with evaluating uh, epithelial proliferations of breast and uh, breast duct tissue. The other thing I will point out, and I've never seen one of these, is there's another disease that has a similar name, and it's called infiltrating syringomatous adenoma of the nipple. Kind of annoying, right? The I've never actually seen a case, not even in a study set. From what I've read, it basically sounds to me like microcystic adnexal carcinoma, but on the nipple. And it's locally aggressive and has a tendency to recur. So I kind of wonder, maybe it actually is like almost MAC or a relative of MAC, but I have no personal experience with that entity. But that's the way I kind of have conceptualized it in my mind. This Nipple adenoma, erosive adenomatosis is benign and looks like an introductal papilloma or a usual ductal hyperplasia of the breast. And that other disease, ISAN, in infiltrating syringomatous adenoma of the nipple, is kind of infiltrative, looks like MAC, like thin little ducts that infiltrate the tissue. All right. So, but this is really a perfect example, I think, of nipple adenoma. All right. On this, the past one, I kind of was thinking a little bit about the colon. Um, it just looks like dirty there was kind of like a long columnar border right that's a fair point there it, there are columnar cells here i think the one thing is that there are in addition to those glands that have uh, columnar cells 
we have a lot of papillae, right? There are a lot of papillae. Now, you can get papillary types of carcinoma and micropapillary carcinomas of the colon and about every other site. I mean, so that's actually possible. But the thing like from conventional colon cancer versus this, I think all of the papillary structures are the thing that would point me towards this. Also, the fact that we're on the nipple is helpful. Um, and I do think the, the necrosis here, I think what we're having is most of this is keratin debris and the necrosis is related to dead keratin rather than the tumor cells undergoing. So there's not like much nuclear dust um, uh, from, from or ghosted out tumor cells. We actually just seeing some keratin in the background. And that's probably because we're getting some, some dilation, cystic dilation of some of the breast ducts um, towards the skin surface. And then those are rupturing. I'm imagining is what's happening. The other thing I was going to say is... Well, we can't really see, but but I think it, you get the impression of this being a nipple duct right here, a lactiferous duct, that all of these, they look, it looks like this is like the same lining as the nipple duct. And then here, the proliferation is coming right out of that. So basically, it's arising from the actual duct lining of the nipple duct, which would be really unusual, I think, for, for metastatic disease. So whenever you can find a pre-existing structure that an epithelial proliferation is arising out of in the skin, that's a good sign that that is, it is originating right there at that site rather than spread from somewhere else. Now that's in theory, that's easy to do, but in practice, it's, it's oftentimes not present or it's hard to, to decide for sure if that's what's happening. So, but yeah, I think you're right. The columnar change in some of these, it's definitely fair to think of, of that, of colon cancer at first because of the columnar change, but the papillae, I think really help us. Okay, almost done, uh, 18 and then 19, so two more. And I think 19 is maybe a stain for this. Oh, okay, yes, yes, I see now. I'm looking at the list here, okay. All right, um, so this one, I mean, the busy dermis differential, even from low power, you can yeah. tell it's just like a little bit more cellular than it should be, and the epi looks relatively normal and spared. Okay. Um, and it looks like the cells are kind of going in between the collagen fibers, more like epithelioid as opposed to spindled cells. Oh, good. Um, and some of them have pretty big nuclei. Um, so I'm thinking some sort of MET um, differential would be like metastatic breast cancer infiltrating through the collagen or like even leukemia cutis. But I think leukemia cutis would have like less cytoplasm um, and then the stain the next slide helps me out a little bit too um, so I think it's a pan cytokeratin stain and so um, a lot of those cells are staining positive with pan cytokeratin yeah. so more like a carcinoma type picture yes. but I feel like putting everything together it would fit for um, carcinoma and curos if I'm saying that right but basically like it metastatic breast cancer that's like infiltrating the dermis. Yeah, I mean that, like you said, the stain really solves it here. You can see the single file growth, um, but it's a lot harder, I think, like you said, to appreciate that on H&E. Um, sometimes, uh, and this is, this is classic pattern for metastatic breast carcinoma, but you know, there are other carcinomas that could potentially do this. And I like that you brought up leukemia cutis. I'll go back to that H&E in a second, but the, um, yes, yeah, sometimes you can really see nice single filing and very epithelioid cells. This case is much more subtle. So I was mentioning to you earlier that I've seen a case that mimic GA. Um, yeah, this, I think this is actually a really good example of one that has almost a GA or dermatofibroma kind of look at low power a little bit, but then has more epithelioid cells. And here you can see they're kind of making single file lines, but certainly they're, they're kind of in a trail, but they're not packed closely together. Um, so because they're mostly solitary, that c it can be really hard. So um, yes, the cytokeratin stain solves the problem here. But let's go back. On the H&E, I think you're right. The, the, the things that could help solve the problem for you is look finding the epithelioid cytology. There's some atypia here, but it's honestly relatively subtle. I mean, and um, if sometimes you can find focal nest formation or gland formation, that can be helpful to give you a clue. And I totally think uh, leukemia cutis, you're right, it tends to be more cellular than this, but sometimes it can have a fair bit of cytoplasm because a lot of times the leukemia cutis, the form of acute myeloid leukemia that infiltrates the skin tends to have monocytic differentiation. So monocytes are relatives of macrophages and they tend to have more cytoplasm. So I definitely have seen areas of leukemia cutis that look 
very, very similar to this. I mean, almost identical. So I absolutely think it's always good to have leukemia acutis on your mind when you see a kind of infiltrative, uh, kind of plump and large cells in the dermis trickling between collagen. That's what leukemia acutis likes to do is trickle between the collagen. Here you can see the beginnings, I think, of little nest formation. But oh yeah, this is very, very, very subtle and sneaky. So I, anytime I see big cells in the dermis trickling around, I always start to think, you know, in, a, a subtle metastatic uh, carcinoma like a breast cancer. Think of leukemia cutis. Think of, uh, sometimes I'll think of CD30 positive lymphoid things if I see big cells up in the top part of the dermis. Obviously, that's not in my differential here. But um, yeah, it's important because cases like this can be really tricky, especially on a small biopsy. I mean, these, could, these look like histiocytes, really. I mean, they look a lot like histiocytes to my eye, except that they're kind of making little cords and chains and single file. And they're just a little bit too big and too plump. So very good. Uh, yes, metastatic uh, breast carcinoma here. All right, guys, I think that's everything. And uh, excellent work from all of you. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.